Thank you, Dean, and let me add my welcome and congratulations. Graduates, parents, friends, and faculty. One quality I've always noticed about commencement is the dual nature of this party, this ceremony. You're celebrating the end of this part of your education, the conclusion, the culmination. An important chapter of your formal education, and maybe even the final chapter of your schooling. It's right and proper that we all join you in celebrating that. After all, this has been a lot of hard work, I assume, to get to this point, and a lot of money too, perhaps from the people you're surrounded with. But they don't call this ceremony conclusion. They don't call this a culmination ceremony. It's a commencement. It's a beginning. The very word commencement signifies how much this day, this ceremony for you is a beginning. So this begs an important question, a question I thought I'd address in my remarks today. So just what is it you are beginning? You know, one day someone's gonna have the guts as a commencement speaker to give the world's shortest ever commencement speech. He or she'll walk up here to the podium, look into this audience of fresh-faced graduates and proud parents and family, and just say one word, one word. So? Now that wouldn't be this commencement speaker. <laughs> I'm way too talkative to have a one-word commencement speech. I grew up in a great Irish-American family. I'm one of seven children. There's no way I'm giving you a minimalistic commencement speech. You're not getting off that easy. But that single word, so, captures the essence of this moment. And that's what I actually wanna talk about today. You have a degree in the School of Public Health from University of Washington in the year 2015. So, what does that mean? For starters, it means this. You should feel immense gratitude. You're the fortunate ones. There are paths everywhere you turn with this degree. You're graduating from a consensus top 10 School of Public Health at precisely the moment when the entire field is assuming greater prominence and importance. Don't take this development for granted. Not long ago, public health was almost an afterthought. Public health has always attracted some genuinely brilliant minds, but public health actually didn't loom very large in the broader consciousness or in the career plans of many young people. That has changed. In fact, one of the most remarkable changes that I've observed in my career is the decades-long growth and maturation of the field of what we call public health. Public health is now a magnet, a magnet for some of the world's best talent and some of the most innovative thinking. Society has taken notice. Time's Person of the Year for 2014 was the Ebola fighter in West Africa. Not Vladimir Putin, not Taylor Swift, a group of public health workers operating in one of the poorest regions of the world, Ebola fighters in West Africa. Something has changed. The field of public health has entered the world's awareness. That's an important development because this discipline fully merits the world's attention and deserves the talents of our brightest and most dedicated people. It's a fascinating field of study and a fertile ground in which to spend a career. I loved what your dean wrote about the sheer richness and variety of public health, and I'm gonna quote him. Public health is grounded in science, from molecular genetics to epidemiology to toxicology, and it's grounded in values from social justice to public service. It's about idealism, our shared passion to make the world a better place, and it's about hard-headed realism. 
our commitment to implementing policies and programs that work. One reason why this really speaks to me and why I take such pride in the growth of the public health sector is that I identify very personally with this entire discipline. Now, I've had a varied career. One of my deans told me that I actually had all the jobs that any of you could aspire to. I've been a researcher, president for product development at the biotech company Genentech, and chancellor at University of California, San Francisco, and now as leader in philanthropy at the Gates Foundation, there is actually a unifying theme that brings together all the roles I've been fortunate to play. I think of myself essentially as a public health doctor. I value that aspect of my professional identity. In other words, I'm actually one of you graduates. And this question I'm posing to you about your education and what you do with it, that so question came to me with great force during my own student years. After finishing medical school, I did my clinical training at University of California, San Francisco. One of the most difficult and painful aspects of my work in the early 80s was seeing the earliest phases of a true public health catastrophe. This was the San Francisco Bay Area in the 80s, very frightening. There was a disease taking the lives of many gay men in that city. In the ensuing three decades, HIV AIDS has gone on to kill an estimated 39 million people worldwide. And AIDS has served as a stark reminder of just how high the stakes are in public health. During those early years of this epidemic, first in San Francisco, and then later as a researcher living in Uganda studying heterosexual transmission of HIV, I got a very close look at what happens when public health systems fail. That so question hit me right in the face with each patient I saw and with each patient I lost. I thought very hard about what my own education meant and how I might use it. I became deeply interested in the public health aspects of medicine. In fact, I went on after my MD to get a degree, a master's in public health at UC Berkeley. This was one of the best decisions of my career. So many of my hopes and dreams have been made possible because of my formal training in public health, including areas like epidemiology, biostatistics, and clinical trials methodology. I learned the usefulness of this education very early on and that my degree would mean much more than those three letters MPH that I could stick at the end of my name. My training in epidemiology pr proved to be particularly helpful very quickly. Later at Genentech, I used my clinical trial skills to help develop anti-cancer drugs. Rituxan, Avastin, and Herceptin were delivered to the public throughout a lot of great methodology in clinical trials. When I was later in a position to hire clinical scientists to Genentech, I would always say that I wanted to hire people who think like epidemiologists. In other words, people who think about the natural history of disease and our ability to shape the course of that natural history, either to prevent a disease, treat it, or improve the outcomes in some way. This approach, grounded in the expansiveness and discipline of public health thinking paid off. Now my goal when I led product development and what I told my colleagues was let's rewrite the medical textbooks. You might think that that's a little arrogant or too ambitious, but in fact I lived through that experience. One day at Genentech I read the New England Journal book review and there was a new book on lymphoma. The book hadn't been updated in 20 years and the book reviewer said that the editors were forced to do an update because the new medicine, Rituxan, had completely changed the outcomes and clinical choices and the best way to treat patients with lymphoma. Well, you can imagine, I copied that, cut it out, and sent it to everyone in my group. In fact, we had forced a rewriting of the medical textbooks through our work and our understanding of lymphoma and our ability to change the natural history. That's actually exactly what happened. 
So I'm telling you this story in order for you to expand your own thinking. When you answer your own question, so what now? Make sure that answer, you, you answer in the clearest and loudest voice you can. Summon that answer from your own heart. And don't underestimate your own impact. Don't diminish your own value. Dare to reach and dream big. Go rewrite the textbooks. Or do what my colleagues and I could not do back in the 80s. Stop the next pandemic before it starts. This kind of big, boundless ambition is what brought me to Seattle, to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. The heart of our organization's ethos is the belief statement, all lives have equal value. And its animating vision, a world where every person has the opportunity to live a healthy and productive life. That commitment to equity, all lives, every person, has a deep inherent appeal for those of us who commit our own lives to public health. After all, health is one of the most basic determinants of well-being for an individual or for a community. When individuals or communities have widely unequal access to vaccines, nutritious foods, and other basic elements of a healthy life, this contributes enormously to broader disparities. Public health, therefore, is central. It's central to the attainment of a more equitable world. Just a few weeks ago, at our foundation's annual employee meeting, we had a surprise guest, Bono, the lead singer of U2 and a great humanitarian. So I thought he'd show up like a rock star, and he, and he did. He brought that with him. But the best insight he shared with us was that he saw our work in global health as being not only about philanthropy or charity, but about something else, justice. That word, justice, if you recall, that's one of the values that Dean Frumkin identified as one of the ground truths of public health. That sensibility is part of who all of us are. All of us, whether you're CEO of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation or a new graduate in public health, justice. For a deeper sense of just how timely your entry is into a public health career, just consider where the world is in 2015, year year of graduation today. This happens to be our 15th anniversary at the Gates Foundation. And to help mark that occasion, Bill and Melinda did something unusual this year. They wrote an annual letter celebrating 15 years. In their annual letter, they announced what they called a big bet. Now, you know I'm from Reno, so I do love a big bet. But this was a special big bet. This was a bet that the lives of people in poor countries will improve faster in the next 15 years than at any other time in history, and that their lives will improve more than anyone else's during that next 15-year period. Central to that big bet is a breakthrough that Bill and Melinda Gates foresee for the coming decade and a half, a significant improvement in global health. Specifically, the annual letter predicts that child mortality rates will go down by half and that more diseases will be eradicated from the earth than ever before. This isn't crazy because of the progress we've already seen. For example, in childhood mortality. The progress over the last half century is extraordinary and provides some of the best proof of how far we've come in global health. As recently as 1960, within the lifelines of many of you in this audience, one child in five worldwide died before his or her fifth birthday, one in five. Within 30 years, by 1990, it was one in 10. Not okay, but an improvement. Today, about a quarter century after that, it's one in 20. Bill and Melinda Gates are predicting that within a mere 15 years from now, we will again cut the rate by at least half again to one in 40 or even better. 
The goal of disease elimination derives from its own track record of success. So far, smallpox is the only human disease that mankind has been able to eradicate outright. But we believe polio may also be on the brink of eradication. In the late 80s, polio was endemic in 125 countries around the world and paralyzed more than 350,000 people each year, mainly young children. Less than three decades later, polio is endemic in only three countries, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Nigeria. And in fact, we may soon be down to two countries, since Nigeria has had a handful of cases in 2014 and may be on the verge of elimination. Worldwide last year, there were less than 400 cases of polio in the world. We think that in the next 15 years, we can bring that number down to zero and also eradicate other diseases like guinea worm, elephantiasis, river blindness, or blinding trachoma. The good news of the past couple decades even extends to some of the most lethal infectious diseases, including HIV AIDS. Since 2000, among children under five worldwide, deaths from AIDS have declined by 50%. For the world population as a whole, the global incidence of HIV has gone down by 20% since its peak in the mid-90s. So this is another piece in your answer to the so question. You're entering a field of life-saving consequence at a time when we know that big victories are possible. Even an outcome that seems today like pure fantasy may become true within a generation. The field is wide open for you, and there's plenty of room to run. This should make you very skeptical of pessimists, cynics, and naysayers, particularly the pessimist, cynic, or naysayer inside of each of you. Don't develop the terrible habit of talking yourself out of your own highest and best aspirations. You owe yourself better than that. You owe the world better than that. The key to achieving continued progress is innovation. It's what us, has brought us already this far. Now, I want to tell you about a local organization I'm sure many of you have heard about here in Seattle, the Global Health Powerhouse PATH. This is one of our foundation's closest partners, and they allow me to make sure you understand what I mean by saying innovation. Now, PATH has been at the forefront of developing things like a low-cost meningitis vaccine, and a single dose system easy to use for injection in poor areas. But the need for innovation goes well beyond making a new vaccine or a new injection system. We urgently need innovations in the way we structure our public health systems. Here's a practical example of that kind of innovation. One of the most frightening moments for the globe over this last year has been the early weeks of the Ebola outbreak. The bad news was that Ebola made its way from three relatively small West African countries to Lagos, Nigeria, an immense city in Africa's most populous nation. If Ebola had taken hold in Nigeria, the epidemic would have been even more terrible than it already had been. Now, as I mentioned, Nigeria has made great progress against polio. Within 12 hours, 12 hours of receiving the news that Ebola was in Lagos, the disease trackers, epidemiologists, and public health experts at emergency operations centers that we helped set up to contend with polio had repurposed those facilities for the fight against Ebola. Partly as a result of this, the number of Ebola cases in Nigeria stayed relatively low. There were only 19 infections in the country with seven deaths, truly a near miracle. But that near miracle was made possible by innovative local approaches in Nigeria to public health infrastructure. They had a system that they could put to work. What if we tried similar innovative approaches to routine immunization or maternal and newborn care? This area of systems innovation is extremely promising and very exciting and still very new. I hope some of you are able to contribute to it in the years to come. Now, before I conclude my comments, I have one more answer to the one-word question 
you're graduating from the University of Washington School of Public Health. So? That answer is this. You're graduating at the dawn of what may prove to be the most exciting next 15 years in the history of mankind's efforts to understand and improve its own collective health. I already told you about the big bet that we're making at the Gates Foundation that improvements in health outcomes for the poor, including child mortality and disease elimination, will be worth betting on. But just a few months from now, the nations of the world will gather to establish new development goals to fight extreme poverty, disease, and environmental degradation. Since 2000, the Millennium Development Goals, or MDGs, have helped to establish clear and meaningful targets for improvements on these issues. For example, the MDGs had specific targets on child mortality, and this target setting has played an important role in the advances we've seen. The MDGs end this year, and in September will be replaced with Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, which will establish new benchmarks between now and 2030. So graduates, here's a challenge for all of you. I'd ask you to think about three things as you graduate, and we celebrate that today. First, pay close attention to the SDGs. After all, these will include the public health goals that the world identifies as top priorities for the next 15 years, a formative period in your own careers. These goals are going to be wide-ranging and ambitious. The odds are about 100% that at least one of those goals will touch upon your specific area of interest and expertise. The objectives that the SDGs lay out for public health should be noted by you and help you think about what they mean for your own work over the next 15 years. Secondly, graduates, even as the world establishes these new goals, think about beating the goals, exceeding them. The greatest achievements in public health tend to originate with people who are willing to think beyond what seems possible, beyond what's respectable, but transformational thinking is what we need. In your chosen field, what is the objective so big that few people are daring enough to even dream about it? You don't want to look too idealistic, but raise the bar. It's there, in that space, that the greatest good can be done. And it's you who are embarking on a new career who will have the most license to think in those terms. So do it. And third and finally, don't fall in love with the problem you're trying to solve. Fall in love with the solution. And be totally willing, even eager, to see your problem disappear. As a young cancer doctor working on AIDS, I saw Kaposi's sarcoma largely disappear from the United States, and I was thrilled. Now, this actually is a little harder than it sounds, particularly for those of you who go into an academic career. Your professional status and your paycheck will derive from your association with a particular public health problem. You're a malaria researcher. You're an NGO point person on malnutrition in a particular re region. And month after month, year after year, people identify you with that problem, whether it's malaria, malnutrition, Kaposi sarcoma, or something else. And perhaps you come to identify yourself with it too. Please don't do this. I want you to be striving to solve the problems you're working on. Solve them. End them. Your entire purpose as a public health professional is to make problems go away. No person anywhere should ever worry about the problems we solve ever again. So have that mindset. Even if you've spent decades squinting into microscopes studying a specific tropical disease, your reaction to the knowledge that that disease is eradicated will be elation and relief. Because for all those years spent in a lab or in the clinic, you're not in love with the problem. You're in love with the solution. And your deepest love of all is for the men, women, children, and families whose lives the solution will spare or whose suffering will be eradicated. So don't worry that there won't be another problem to solve. Public health is filled with problems, and anyone who's eradicating one problem will be in high demand for eradicating the next one in front of them. 
Public health graduates of 2015, the world needs you. And you're showing up at exactly the right time to help us address some of the world's deepest, most urgent problems. My plea to you, help us meet the goals and win the big bets of these next 15 years. Know deep down that when we're placing these big bets on the future, we're really betting on you, the men and women whose careers will shape the future. I'm happy to place these bets because I have faith in you and because the potential winnings are so great. I cannot imagine a bigger, better cause than solving inequities and improving the health of our fellow human beings. Nor can I imagine the full extent of what is possible if you, the graduates of 2015, are willing to think as grandly, as compassionately as this moment demands. All I know is that your life has brought you to a point where you are capable of doing unprecedented good at an unprecedented scale. So be grateful for this opportunity and show that gratitude through the work that you now embark upon. I, for one, cannot wait to see it happen. Congratulations, graduates. Have a wonderful commencement.